registered at second level and served as a communications officer for the Irish Bishops' Conference. Her present ministry is at Mary Immaculate College Limerick, where she teaches sacred scripture. And she has a lifelong interest in sacred scripture and in the, and the life and legacy of Nana Nagel. And so her research interests are Paul's letter to the Romans, the Pauline corpus, the Psalms of Israel, um, intertextuality, hermeneutics, and new developments in um, New Testament studies, liturgy, and church music. And of course, uh, today we are we are getting a treat and and um, hearing Mary talk about you know one of her real research passions, which is the life and legacy of Nana Nagel. Um, and I heard Sister Mary speak very briefly um, a couple of years ago. Um, on her research and was so intrigued it's been a, a treat to um, to have her and it's going to be a treat to hear what you have to say uh, having heard only a hint of it um, in the past um, to share some very recent research with us today so Mary thank you so much and you just need to click your uh, share screen and go to powerpoint and then turn on your powerpoint pre presentation and I should disappear moment now please don't disappear i, will, I promise not disappear. <laughs> don't see that screen coming up ah so you, you've gone you've clicked on share screen yes and it's not showing you your powerpoint presentation as an option to share no no, I don't know. I mean, I had the slide. I have the slides open. The first one, rather. Uh -huh. um, do you want to you know at the bottom of your at the very bottom of your screen? Can you see the PowerPoint uh, logo at the bottom? Yes. Do you want to just click on it? I've done so. Yes. So your slides are there. So if you just yes. go to, if you go to share screen again. Hopefully it'll now appear for you as something you can share. Hmm. Well, we've practiced and we did a perfect job. It's always the way when all the people who are running a little bit late will be absolutely delighted. This is all a part of the plan. Um, yeah. Sasha, will you pop in and just give us a hand here? Um, I know that Sasha enabled you to, uh, to share uh, your slides as a, an, a, as a panellist. Yeah. Um, sometimes it just takes a second. Maybe if you X out of your PowerPoint and open it again, Sister Mary. Okay, I'll try that. Yeah. <clears throat> And just for our attendees today, if you have any questions for Sister Mary uh, throughout her presentation, if you could please direct them to the Q&A box at the bottom of your screens. Uh, and myself and Danielle will be keeping an eye on the questions and we will ask Sister Mary all of your burning questions at the end. Now I have the slides up, but I can't see you. Ah. You can't see us. Do you want to, is the Zoom icon down at the bottom of your screen, the little video camera? Yes. You click that. I can't get that now because this is... Uh, have you got the slideshow turned on? I have, um, yes, for number one slide, yeah. Um, have you actually gone to view slideshow? Are you, are you just, um, do you just have it open and you can see all of your little index of slides along the left-hand side? Yes. I think try it again now, Sister Mary, because it might have been an issue from, from my end here. Okay. So click that but, screen, share screen button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. You, is, your, is your slideshow taking up your whole screen now, Sister Mary? It is. Yeah, it is. Just, just press escape, ESC, up in the top left-hand corner. I don't see it. It should be actually on your keyboard, not on, no, actually, sorry, on your keyboard, oh, not on your, um, yeah, ESC. Oh, yes. Good. That's done. And then you should be able to see Zoom at the bottom of your screen again, the little camera. Yes. Because we can see you, so you're still here. Okay. And Sasha said, she, if you have a go at the share screen again now, she's just changed a few settings. 
I'm in the wrong, the wrong slide is up anyway. We can navigate the slideshow after as long as you as long as you can share it will be. I have some slides up. If you just click on your Zoom uh, page there, Sister Mary, the green button at the bottom that says share screen. Done. And can you see your PowerPoint now? Mm, I can see it, but it's 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 not what I want. I have two slides showing, and I don't want to. I still haven't got where oh, I want. Oh, just, just click, if you click on the slide, if you click on that, Mary, we can navigate to what you want afterwards. Okay. So click on that. There we go. Ah -ha! Hooray! Is that correct? I Absolutely correct. And then can you see at the very bottom of your slideshow, um, there's uh, there's the kind of the bottom right hand corner, there's a um, a little button that looks like um, a presentation that you, a screen that you project onto. If you pop that one. Okay, but I'm on slide four. So you might just, yeah, we'll have to navigate back a little bit. So thank you everybody for, for their patience. Uh, we are, we are there. We all just guns were. blazing. So I'm going to disappear, <laughs> um, Mary, and uh, really looking forward to hearing it. Uh, welcome to everybody who's here. Questions into the question and answer box and any happy comments you have into the chat box. And Sister Mary, thank you very much. Take, take it away. And thank you, Danielle and Sirka for your patience. Uh, hello, everyone. And welcome to this time of reflection. And again, thanks to Danielle and Sorka for their help, not just today, but another day last week as well. Um, thanks to all who are joining us. And I'm aware that I'll be talking to some people who know a lot more about nanoregal than I do. And I'm probably also talking or maybe talking to some people who are just being introduced to nanoregal for the first time. So prepare for a little mixed grill. That's the best I can do with it. Uh, our topic this evening is cultural diversity and migration in nanonagles early years. And you'll notice that there is a question at the end of that title. So I'll be looking for your help later on. In this presentation, we will be taking, um, as it were, snapshots of nanonagles early years, up to the age of 16 or so, probably the most impressionable years of anybody's life. We will consider some of the unusual opportunities that came her way and the gifts that were fostered in those early years. It may be argued that such opportunities fostered a breadth of experience, unusual for a young person in her era, and that these may have been foundational in forming the woman of global vision who we now know Nanonagel to be. But because today is such a very special day, we salute Venerable Nanonagel on this, the 238th anniversary of her death. I begin by quoting from a letter written by Eleanor Fitzsimons to Teresa Mullally, dated the 21st of May, 1784, just four weeks after Nano's death. And both Eleanor and Teresa were close friends of Nano. And here is what she says. She, this Nano, expired about one o'clock on Monday, the 26th of April, the sixth day of her illness, in the 69th year of her age, as much regretted on earth as she was welcomed in heaven, where I hope she is now interceding for us that we may follow her great example." End of quote. And we take a moment in silence as we give God thanks for the life and legacy of Nanonagel. Thank you. We note a slight error there in the uh, notice. Uh, she didn't actually die in the 69th year of her age. She died in the 66th. 
uh, Sister Claire Callahan of Silk Presentation has recorded in the Silk Presentation Annals. I hope that you are now ready to come on a journey with me, a reverse journey, if you like, revisiting Nano's early years, reflecting on some of the factors which possibly had a lasting influence on her life and vision. Essentially, we will be dealing with two phases. Uh, firstly, uh, the first phase dealing with her childhood years in Valley Biffin, and the second, from age 10 to 16, approximately, in a boarding school in mainland Europe. Firstly, her childhood in Ballywiffen. Born in 1718 into the wealthy and well-known branch of the Nagel family in Ballywiffen, Nano was the eldest of seven children, five girls and two boys. On her mother's side, she was descended from the Matthews of Thomastown and Lady Thurless. She lived her entire life under the shadow of the penal laws, which were not repealed until 1791, seven years after her death. Un under that cruel regime, Catholics were forbidden to practice their faith, to teach in a school, or to facilitate the education of their children. Severe penalties were imposed on anyone who defied the laws or attempted to send children abroad for education. William Hutch, writing in 1875, states that the Nagel children received their early education at home. And I quote, Nano Nagel received from her parents the rudiments of her religious and literary education they imparted to their child such liberal, secular training as was suited to her years, unquote. It is probable that Nano's parents, Garrett and Anne Nagel, employed a tutor, possibly a wandering schoolmaster or poet, or perhaps more than one, to ensure the best of homeschooling for Nano and her siblings in their early years. This would have been the norm for well-to-do families at the time. And there is anecdotal evidence that Nano attended the nearby hedge school in the ruins of Mananami Castle, originally a Nagel castle, which her famous cousin Edmund Burke also attended in his early years. That hedge school was run by a Mr. O'Halloran, perhaps a Jesuit in disguise, though we're not sure of that. Edmund mentions that all teaching at the hedge school was through Irish. And from this, it is reasonable to assume that Irish was the main language of Nano's primary education, a fact confirmed by an important letter, which we will discuss in a moment. Irish would have been <clears throat> the language of the servants, <clears throat> excuse me, in the Nagel home, and of the tenants who occupied and managed the extensive 250-acre Nagel property in the Blackwater Valley. It would also have been the language spoken in Nano's maternal Matthew home in the 18th century and in South Tipperary generally until quite recently. And for this information, I am greatly indebted to my colleague, Nisha Nikalik. The comment by Daniel Corkery, author of The Hidden Ireland, is surely worth noting. And I quote, If one could, with an imaginative assurance, enter the Nagel family home, a house where Irish was spoken to their Kerry labourers and English to their visitors from Dublin, then one should be qualified to tell the story of Ireland in the 18th century, unquote. Isn't that an extraordinary statement? And I'm grateful to my friend in Derry, Victoria Pearson, for pointing me to this important reference. Yet it is strange that Nano's earlier biographers, such as Coppinger, Hutch, and Walsh, 
do not specify the everyday language of the Nagel home. Neither do they give details of Nano's homeschooling or of the subjects taught there. But we do know that Gaelic and English were the languages used in her cabin schools some decades later. This fact is a pointer to the widespread use of the Irish language in 18th century Ireland, well before English became the official language of the state in the early 1800s. And it also assures us that Nano was no stranger to Irish. <coughs> However, because of the many links between the Nagels and continental Europe, it is reasonable to assume that French and English were not unfamiliar languages to them. It is known that Garrett Nagel had <coughs> me, extensive business interests in Flanders and that he was agent for the exiled King James there. In fact, he and Anne Matthew were married in Flanders and two of the Nagel children were born there. Garrett Nagel lived in Flanders for many years and is possibly buried there. Many of the Nagels, including Nano's uncles, served in high office and in legal circles. So Richard Nagel, for example, was a speaker in the Irish Parliament and later Attorney General. And when King James was defeated in 1690 at the Battle of the Boyne, Sir Richard Nagel accompanied the defeated King to France and became Secretary of State at the court of Saint Germain. Since English was the only language tolerated in the law courts from 1537, strengthened by another law in 1541, it is reasonable to assume that English was spoken regularly among families with connections abroad, such as the Matthews and Nagels. It would also be the language mainly used by the merchant class to whom many Nagels belonged. English would eventually become the adopted language for girls of Nano's status who were destined to be educated abroad. What about French? <clears throat> French was the language of many of Nano's exiled relatives. Garrett Nagel certainly did not do business in Flanders, which was then French territory, without it. And Nano does mention in a letter to Eleanor Fitzsimons that her French is poor and that she would require help if writing in French. And she did get help when she was writing letters in French. But we do find traces of French in her writings, such as adieu at the conclusion of two letters and French constructions such as, and I quote, the house gave on the street, unquote, and any disappointment is sensible, sensible. And there are other transliterations in her letters worth noting. <clears throat> All the letters of Nano that have been preserved are in English, not exceptionally good English, it must be said. But these letters all stem from her adult life. We do recall her father's <clears throat> excuse me, comment presumably originally in English, <clears throat> reported by early biographers that our Nano will be a saint yet. From all this, we can conclude that Nano had something like a bilingual and multicultural upbringing during her years in Valley Griffin, even perhaps some trilingual experience, French, Irish, and English. And her childhood horizons extended far beyond the local scene. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> the Nagels of Bella Griffin were staunchly Catholic, as were the Matthews, but many of Nano's cousins on both sides had become crypto-Catholics, adopting the Protestant faith publicly to preserve their property and to avoid persecution while secretly practicing Catholics. Nano's cousin, Edmund Burke, professed the Protestant faith, as did many of the Matthews and Nagels. 
Tradition has it that Joseph Nagel, Nano's wealthy uncle, declared himself Protestant to preserve his property while secretly supporting every Catholic cause, including Nano's schools later. So Nano's childhood milieu was colored by interchurch relations on both sides of the family. Archbishop Matthew, cousin to Nano, described the Thomastown Matthews as a cat's cradle of relationships. Make what you like of that. Without doubt, Nano grew up in a truly unconventional setting with relatives on both sides registered as pro practicing Protestants, even though some were only nominally so. She had close relatives, both Catholic and Protestant, and some who crossed religious boundaries regularly as circumstances dictated. Hers was no ordinary childhood in terms of church affiliation, at least. It was in fact, singularly ecumenical. <clears throat> what about social diversity, poverty and luxury? The young Nano couldn't avoid being influenced by the poverty all around her among tenants, servants and neighbors and by the contrast between their life and hers. She experienced relative luxury, even while adult members of her family feared for their lives and liberty, many having been deprived of their lands and property. Many others, a majority in fact, had been forced to emigrate. She grew up in family circles where migration was the norm. International travel and contacts with mainland Europe were the order of the day. Her experience in Valley Griffin as a child crossed many social boundaries and was multifaceted and varied in more ways than one. We can safely say that it was cross-cultural and notably so. <clears throat> a word about international connections, travel, and trade. Countess Nagel cousins were among the Irish diaspora in France, Spain, and Portugal. We know that the Nagel family had many relatives in mainland Europe, with some serving in the military and legal professions, others on duty in the royal courts, and many engaged in commerce. Quite a few of Nano's relatives were Jesuit and Franciscan priests who were expelled from Ireland during the persecutions of 1698. According to Tucky's Cork Remembrancer newspaper, 75 clergy, including Jesuits and friars, were shipped from Cork in that year, <clears throat> their passage being paid for by an act of parliament. Among them was the Catholic Bishop of Cork, <clears throat> Dr. John Slyne, who was first imprisoned for five years before being sent to Lisbon, where he died in 1712, just six years before Nana was born. We can only surmise <clears throat> that such events were part of table talk in the Nagel home during Nana's years, and that the Nagel family members kept contact with their emigre cousins abroad. <clears throat> Regarding trade, <clears throat> the port of Cork was the busiest in the country and one of the busiest in Europe. It had regular trade connections with Bristol, Bordeaux, other European ports, and with the West Indies where the Nagels had property. Large quantities of salted butter, beef and pork were exported regularly to the American colonies to feed the British army there. And the regular imports included wine, cloth and spices. <clears throat> Many of Cork's merchant families, the Roaches, the Lombards, the Goulds and others were related to the Nagels. The Moylan family, also merchants, were to give Nano her greatest collaborator, Francis Moylan, later Bishop of Kerry and then of Cork. And if you want to know more about that amazing man, consult the expert, Victoria Pearson of Derry. 
Thank you, Victoria. During Nano's childhood years, contact with mainland Europe was regular, and it is known that Bath in England was home to some branches of the Nagels. With them, family connections extended far beyond the boundaries of Killabullen and County Cork. <clears throat> Political affiliations. According to Hutch, and I quote, Miss Nagel had indeed the bluest of blue blood in her veins, but she did not pride herself on the fact. Unquote. She was connected to royalty to her parents on both sides. From her mother's side, a direct line can be established between Nano and Elizabeth Points, Lady Thurlis, whose second marriage was to Captain George Matthew. The late Princess Diana Spencer, as well as the present Prince Charles of England, can both claim direct descendancy from Viscount and Lady Thurlis through the Duke of Ormond. So on that score, Nano is related to both Lady Diana Spencer and to Prince Charles of England. As an aside, her connection with the poet Edmund Spencer who lived for some years at Kilcolman Castle, near Donnerail, not too far from Ballygriffin, can be traced to the marriage of Ellen Nagel, daughter of David Nagel of Monanamy Castle, to Sylvanus Spencer, father of the poet Edmund Spencer. <coughs> and, <coughs> excuse me, moreover, that um, picture that you're looking at, Chateau of Saint Germain, the Shadow Court, uh, is an important place because I believe that's the place Nano went to when she did first go to France. <clears throat> but the established links between the Nagels and King James II, there he is, um, <clears throat> they are hugely important and their influence on young Nano cannot be ignored. Garrett Nagel, as we know, was agent for the Stuarts in Flanders and collected money in Ireland for the Stuart cause. Several of the Nagels served in the shadow court of Saint Germain, the last one we've seen, where the exiled King James and his wife, Mary of Modena, lived for many years, courtesy of Louis XIV, who was actually a first cousin to James, after the glorious revolution of 1688. Many Jacobites, including Nano's relatives, continued to, to live there until 1793, just as the rumblings of the French Revolution were in the air. It seems that the Matthews were enthusiastic Jacobites too, if the details on a precious gold ring are correct, and we have no reason to doubt their authenticity. The gold ring, was seemingly a gift to the North Presentation community at its foundation in 1799 from someone in South Presentation, Cork. Now you really can't see the ring in detail, there it is, but in there, there's JS and a, a lock of the hair of this man, King James. And there's a note beside it, which I'll, I'll read for you because it's not so clear on that slide. <clears throat> that explanatory note reads, and I quote, this ring was in Nano Nagel's possession. Some member of her family received it from James II, probably her mother or grandmother. As tradition says, he, the king, took it from his finger and handed it to a lady with whom he had been conversing in a traveling carriage in France as a token of his esteem. This lady was probably mother or grandmother to our illustrious foundress." Unquote. From these examples, we get some idea of the royal and courtly connections which formed part of the experience of young Nano Nagel. As a curious and intelligent child, she must have asked for stories true stories, not fairy tales, about kings and castles and family heirlooms. We can only guess. And at this stage, 
I just offer a summary of phase one of Nano's life, <clears throat> a life in Valley Griffin up to age 10. It was multilingual. It was interchurch. It involved migration. It involved social diversity and political diversity and many connections with royalty through the Stuarts. Are you ready for phase two? <clears throat> Nano's education abroad. And I'm quoting from Coppinger here. And this is kind of standard among all the uh, biographers. When she had gone through the rudiments of female education, she was sent for the politer accomplishments to Paris and being gift with, gifted with superior talents, fulfilled in every particular the expectation of her friends Friends in this context means relatives all the time. Uh, uniting with an agreeable person, the most engaging manners and the more lasting attractions of a cultivated mind. <clears throat> Her stay in Paris, if it happened, must have been brief because all biographers agree that she left Bella Griffin at age 10. And the letter of 1969, to which we will refer in a moment, states that she was in boarding school elsewhere from age 10 to 16. So we must not be surprised <clears throat> that there's contradiction here, possibly, and we mustn't be surprised at the secrecy surrounding Nano's education abroad because of the severe penalties imposed on anyone who dared to flout the penal laws. So, an important question, where did Nano Nagel go? Where was she educated from age 10 to 16? And up to 1969, it was generally thought that she was educated either in the Benedictine convent at Fontevraud in Western France, where she had two carny cousins, or else in the prestigious convent of Saint-Cyr, run by Les Dames de Saint-Louis in central Paris. And there were theories about Cambrai, where there were Nagels, and Nantes, where there were also a family, a family branch of Nagels. And the jury was out on that <clears throat> until um, an important letter was discovered in 1969. And because of that letter, we now know that she was educated in the Benedictine convent at Ypres, about 50 kilometers west of Brussels. Today, the town of Ypres is Flemish speaking and part of Flanders. In Nano's time, it belonged to France and it was largely French speaking. So many Irish women belonged to that Benedictine community at Ypres that it was known as the Royal Irish Abbey at Ypres and it merited a worthy and extensive 536 page history by Patrick Nolan OSB entitled The Irish Dames of Ypres. And it's a fascinating read. While that book does not mention Nano Nagel or her schooling, it does give the history of the Benedictine Girls Boarding School, which was eagerly sought by Irish families who desired a worthy education for their daughters. The community in Ypres at one stage consisted entirely of Irish members. The list of surnames is interesting. Harney, Gould, Lombard, Butler, Lynch, O'Brien, Cray, MacArthur, and Nagel. Records of the Benedictines in Kyle Moore, and as you know, that's linked historically with Ypres. These records show that there were two Nagels, perhaps blood sisters, in the Ypres community in the 18th century during Nano's time there. Dame Mechthild Nagel, professed in 1738, died in 1752, aged 31 years. And Dame Antonio Nagel, also professed in 1738, died in 1795, aged 73 years. Moreover, the Benedictine convent at Ypres was owned and financed by an Irish consortium of Stuart supporters among whom we can surely count some Nagels. But the strongest evidence that Nano Nagel was a boarder there 
comes from a letter written in 1969 by Maureen Stewart, later Dame Bernard Stewart, to Sister Camilla Scalvin of the Presentation Convent in Fargo. But before I move to uh, the next slide, I'm drawing your attention to the one that's up screen at the moment. That is a, a picture taken in 1914 of the ruins of the Benedictine Abbey where Nana was educated. And I've taken that from Nolan's book. <clears throat> to the letter. Up at the right hand corner, you'll see a picture of Sister Camilla Scalvin. She's a hugely important figure in this whole discovery. She's the author of the book From Acorn to Oak. <clears throat> and she received a letter from Kylemore Abbey from Dame Bernard Stewart, stating that when she, that's Dame Bernard, was, an, was a boarder at Ypres in 1908, she was told by Dame Josephine Fletcher that Nano Nagel, founder of the Presentation Nuns, was educated at this school. <clears throat> I quote a relevant extract from that letter because it tells us quite a few important things about Nano's education at the Abbey. I'm quoting. When I went to school at Ypres in October 1908, Dame Josephine Fletcher told me that Nano Nagel, the founders of the Presentation Sisters, was educated here. In 1728, she was sent to school at Ypres. She was 10 years old when she came. And according to the constitution, she left at the age of 16. Dame Ignatia Gould was mistress of borders. She was related to the Nagels, as were several of the community. There is also a tradition that Nano entered there later, but remained only a short time, as a Jesuit confessor advised her to return to Ireland and give herself to work for the poor of that nation. From Ypres, she went to Paris, where she had many relatives. That's an extract from the letter. <clears throat> and it's important to remember that during the time when Nana was aboard at Ypres, I'm saying 1728 to 1734, approximately, the abbess happened to be Dame Zaveria Arthur, whose family of origin was Norman Irish from County Clare, her sister was married to James Cray, nephew of the Archbishop of Dublin. And Nano, in her letters, as some of you will know, mentions the Cray family more than once. And just a few more pictures of Ypres. I didn't take them. I've taken them from Nolan with his permission. That's a picture of the actual convent where Nano was educated, as it was pre-war the old convent in Rue Saint-Jacques. There's no trace of it right now. There are apartments and a mini hotel built on the site. And there you can look at the same building from the ramparts that would be from the back of the building, uh, which can be done today, but you're looking at a set of apartments. And uh, this picture, uh, I don't know, there's no date on it. <clears throat> I get it from uh, Jack Rooney has written um, a biography of uh, of Kyle, uh, yes, a biography of Kyle Moore. Um, and uh, we, we don't know the date at which that picture was taken. <clears throat> okay, so the question is, can we take that letter of 1969 as credible? Many historians, even over the years, have been cautious in acknowledging its authenticity. And I can understand why. It seemed problematic that a presentation sister in Fargo, North Dakota, should be corresponding with a Benedictine dame in Kylemore Abbey, Ireland, when they didn't seem to have anything else in common. They were not related by family ties. And the archives of Fargo and Kylemore do not yield any helpful data on that issue. Close relatives of Sister Camillus Galvin, namely Sister Margaret Mary Galvin and her sister, Sister Columba Mary Galvin of this province, 
They remember Sister Camillus visiting their family home. And they did try to establish the connection between their cousin, Sister Camillus, and the dames of Kylemoor Abbey, and that search was in vain. The seemingly insoluble puzzle ended with the casual conversation between Sister Rosaria Acton, a picture is on the screen, uh, born in England of Irish parents. She was sent as a boarder to Kylemoor uh, um, in order to be near her Galway relatives at vacation times. It was she who told Sister Camillus Galvin of her memories of hearing about Nano Nagel being in school in Ypres. And at that time, Sister Camillus Galvin was writing the precious book on Nano Nagel from Acorn to Oak. Armed with this new and exciting information, she then wrote to Dame Bernard Stewart of Kyle Moore to verify the story. And important correspondence between Fargo and Kyle Moore continued, which has cast a beam of light on Anna Nagel's education and also on aspects of her spirituality, as we will see. There is no reason whatsoever to doubt the authenticity of the 1969 letter and its contents. I've been talking to Sister Rosaria Acton, who died just a few years ago, um, and I think we all, as presentation people, and presentation family, we owe a huge debt to the Fargo community in North Dakota, to Sister Camilla Galvin and to Sister Rosaria Acton, to whom I've talked, um, for the light that they have cast on the life story of Nano Nagel. Thank you, Fargo. A word about the curriculum in, in Ypres. Details? of that curriculum are not available, but we know that English was the language of the school that comes from the letter. Unfortunately, many records of the school and convent were destroyed during World War I, when the town of Ypres was razed to the ground. A fire in 1959 in Kyle Moor destroyed, and destroyed any remaining documents that had been salvaged from the Ypres convent by the sisters. But it's possible to reconstruct a typical subject list from other sources. Girls of wealthy families were educated with a view to their future status in society. An interesting piece of advice from Francoise de la Motte Fenelon uh, in, in French, uh, sorry, in English, it's a treatise on the education of girls. Uh, used as a very important guide for schools at that time, it gives us clues, and I'm quoting in translation. Because girls are meant to fulfill roles as housewives and mothers, they should pursue religious and moral education rather than scholarly learning. They should learn reading and writing, basic mathematics, history, music, needlework, and Latin, because it is a church language, but no modern languages, since they tend to moral corruption. Education, he maintained, should make the lady of the house both Christian and accomplished, neither ignorant nor precious. Unquote. A list of the subjects taught by Les Dames de Saint Louis in the famous school of Saint Cyr uh, gives a similar list reading, writing, drawing, music, moral philosophy but the chief subject was catechetical instruction. From another source, namely a study by an American historian, Annie Louise Potter, such a range of subjects can be confirmed with the addition of lace making, which was a thriving cottage industry in the Ypres and Bruges area in the 18th century. According to Annie Louise Potter, Nano introduced lace making into Ireland, and she supports her case well. But even if there is a competing theory that the Brigidian sisters of Kildare were the first to do so, it simply strengthens our case that lace making was an important part of the curriculum at Ypres, because Judith Brown, first director of the Brigidians, was educated at the same Benedictine convent as Nano in Ypres. Interesting. 
From all of this, we can infer that Nana received an education at Ypres worthy of her status. She was educated through the medium of English and in the company of students from a variety of backgrounds. We guess that she must have longed for family life and for the freedom of Ballet Griffin, but we can imagine her treasuring those visits from her father who was living in Flanders at the time. We would love to see her report cards, but they're not available. From Dr. Coppinger, who preached her panegyric 10 years after her death, we learn that Nano must have been among the brightest. And there you have a couple of quotes. <clears throat> From Hutch, we learn she was gifted with superior talents and fulfilled in every particular the expectation of her friends, equals relatives, uniting with an agreeable person the most engaging manners and the most lasting attractions of a cultivated mind. That's Hutch. And Carpenter says something similar. Nana was possessed of the social graces, interesting in conversation, dignified in her address, neither little in her affability, insipid in her mildness, nor austere in her gravity. An interesting anecdote from the Annals of Self-Presentation Cork shows the adult nano to be capable of moving with ease from one social scene to another, even as she busied herself with seeking funds for the upkeep of her schools. And I quote, for some time after she returned home, that's from France to Ireland, and she has her schools pretty well set up at this time, she piously conformed to the habits of the family with which she lived, that's her brother Joseph and his wife. She joined in their parties at home and with their friends and relatives. But when it came to card playing, she would retire to her devotions. Unquote. You know that Nano didn't like card playing. Education at the Benedictine convent at Ypres, as well as her childhood experience in Barry Griffin, must have been contributory to that level of social flexibility. Now we come to some of the really important the Jesuit influence on Nano Negi and devotion to the Sacred Heart. <clears throat> Firstly, there is the Jesuit influence with its accompanying devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And again, from this letter of 1969, we get a good clue, and I quote, In 1704, devotion to the Sacred Heart had been officially established at the school and the pupils were enrolled. Nana wasn't even born then, of course, but in 1727, a year before she arrived in Ypres, we learn of the efforts of a certain Reverend Stephen Amio S.J. to exempt the Irish Benedictine nuns from taxes because of their exile situation. So therefore he must have been either a manager of that convent and school or at least a chaplain, we're not sure. But he was a Jesuit. And of another Jesuit priest, Father Dallas S.J., some decades later, we're told that he was the director of the convent and of the borders, and that he erected a confraternity of the Sacred Heart with authorization from the Bishop of Ypres in 1780. Of course, Nana was back in Ireland then, but the letter of Dame Bernard, which has been already cited, states that Nano established the devotion in Cork. And from that letter, another excerpt is enlightening. In 1704, during the Octave of Corpus Christi, a retreat was preached to the Ypres community by Father Louis Sabron S.J. He had been a companion of Blessed Claude de la Colombière at the court of St. James and was then stationed at Paris Le Monial. He preached on devotion to the Sacred Heart. In 1720, the entire community with the chaplain, Mr. Jeremy O'Donnell, 
joined a confraternity established with Episcopal approval by the Jesuits at Bruges. And finally, in 1732, when the Arch Confraternity was established in Rome, the community and their pupils were enrolled and a private association was established in the school to promote the devotion among the pupils. End of quote. Very important quotation. Hanno Nagel was surely among that student cohort and devotion to the Sacred Heart, as we know, was an obvious feature of her spirituality in later life. According to Nolan, the Irish Dames were one of the first communities outside of France to introduce devotion to the Sacred Heart after its establishment at Paris Le Monial. And Jack Rooney states that, and I quote, in fact, the Irish Dames claimed to have introduced Belgium as a whole to this particular devotion. Even a superficial glance at the writings of Nano Nagel will reveal traces of the Jesuit influence on her spirituality. We we'll have a book on this. Constantly searching for the divine will, her efforts, as she repeatedly says, are directed towards the greater glory of God. Devotion to the Sacred Heart of Jesus is important to her. She names her fledgling community Sisters of Charitable Instruction of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. And her first residence in Cork was known as the House of the Sacred Heart. Even though she does not explicitly mention St. Ignatius or the spiritual exercises in her writings, Jesuit influence features strongly in her spirituality as does devotion to the Sacred Heart. Her years as a boarder in the Benedictine convent in Ypres cannot be discounted as formative of that spirituality. A word about Nano and anti-Jansenism. <clears throat> because Cornelius Jansen had been Bishop of Ypres, where Nano spent six of the most impressionable years of her life, and because of the long-standing theological battle between Jansenists and Jesuits, which still raged during her time at Ypres, it is reasonable to assume that she was affected by that battle. Jansen taught some controversial versions of St. Augustine's teachings on grace and predestination. He held that human nature was intrinsically corrupt and he professed an extremely austere manner, manner of living the Christian life and a joyless spirituality. The Jesuits did not agree, neither did Nano. She was anti Jansenist. Sorry. She was anti Jansenist. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, <coughs> as the Jesuits of her time were known to be. And in her writings, she expresses concern lest one of the Ursuline novices in Paris be tainted with Jansenism. <laughs> We're coming near the end. Devotion to Mary of the Presentation. The Feast of the Presentation of Mary in the Temple was named the School Feast Day in the Benedictine Convent at Ypres, and it was solemnly celebrated each year. It was also the day <coughs> on which Jesuits took final vows. The letter of 1969 states, and I quote, the presentation of Mary was the school feast at Ypres. Devotion to Mary under the title of Our Lady of the Presentation was widespread in France during the Middle Ages and later, and it was solemnly celebrated in Ypres, probably introduced there by the Jesuits. It's not surprising, therefore, that Father Lawrence Calnan, advised by the sisters, made application to Rome in 1791, seven years after Nano's death, for the name of the fledgling congregation to be renamed Sisters of the Presentation of the Blessed Virgin Mary, because he writes, and I quote, Nano was ever known to have a particular devotion to Mary under the title of Our Lady of the Presentation. Conclusion. 
you'll be glad to hear. <clears throat> young Nano did not possess the must-haves common among young people today. She didn't have a mobile phone or internet access or a profile on social media. But she was gifted with a range of multicultural experiences and opportunities uncommon for a girl in her time. Her childhood years in Ballywiffin and her education later in an exclusive and culturally diverse boarding school in Ypres possibly nurtured in her a resilience above the ordinary and a vision which was remarkably broad and encompassing. The foundations of that vision, wide as the world, were possibly laid down in Nano's early years. That vision knew no boundaries, any service in any part of the world. My views are not for one object alone. Here is what her biographer, William Hutch, has to say. She would spare no efforts in alleviating the temporal wants of her fellow creatures, nor was her spirit of charity limited to any consideration of creed or country. It was in purpose and effect cosmopolitan. Neither was it confined to any particular class. Unquote. And Dr. Coppinger, one of her earlier biographers, says her zeal was so ardent that those who were most intimate with her do not hesitate to declare that were it practicable, she would cheerfully have gone to the extremities of the earth to promote, promote the salvation of her fellow creatures. As we come to the end, I imagine somebody asking, what has all of this got to do with the making of a saint? Answer, everything. Seeing the finger of God <coughs> at work in history means that nothing in life is ever lost or wasted or without purpose. Every circumstance, every influence, Every detail in one's personal story is part of a bigger plan, the divine plan, which orders all things towards their end. Nana herself was keenly aware of this. She writes, the Almighty permits everything for the best. Providence has ordered everything for the best. It is all in the power of the Almighty. And lastly, as we began with a salute to Nano Needle on this, the anniversary of her death, we end with an inspiring word from Dr. Moylan, her loyal friend and supporter. And I'm quoting, at his moment of greatest need, he called on his inspiration, Nano Needle, to stand with him against a potent threat to her ambitious social mission. We don't know what that threat was, we wish we did, uh, and that quote comes to me again from Victoria Pearson, whom I thank. And it was on the 14th anniversary of Nano's death as he was preaching in the North Cathedral in Cork. So Dr. Moylan, who knew her well, obviously regarded her as a saint. Thanks for listening. I welcome your comments and questions. And I'll just end with acknowledging all the help I've got. That's just a slide from the uh, where the original Abbey of Ypres existed, and you can visit there as I've done, and all you'll see are apartments. But this plaque uh, does pay tribute to the Benedictines who lived there for so many years, from 1665 until 1914. And that's a list, I hope it's a, a full list, of those to whom I owe so much. Thank you.